I used to be very much about being perfect, achieving that perfection, and always having this 100% success rate. But you can't really do that through decades and decades of your career, through your life, things like that. Things will always happen. So if things do happen and you are still here and you are still trying and you're still going for your goals, then that just means that you passed one of the biggest tests of all. That brings me to my very first topic that I want to kind of start off this stream with, which is why failing is actually the most important part to succeeding. And what I mean by this is everybody fails. Everybody fails at a certain point, And that is the true test to see if you have long lasting success. Because some people, they do very, very well until they fail one time. And then all of a sudden, they're almost crippled. They become completely different. They become weak. They become unmotivated, all sorts of stuff. And it's the ones that are truly successful that will take that failure, absorb it, and make them stronger, give them even more drive to succeed. And those are the ones that you know, guaranteed, they will always keep going. So that's why if you have gone through your own failures, you've gone through your own troubles and things like that, take that as the test. That is the test to see if you truly have what it takes. I feel more nervous for the people that have never failed, that have been just a, just a rocket ship straight towards the top. Because once that thing gets hit, once they get a little bit of trouble, then you see what they're really made out of. And that's why failing is the most important part to succeeding. And by the way, we are going to have the one and only Tara Whitlatch, creature expert extraordinaire. She's going to be joining us on the stream she's on her way to her studio right now uh, where she is it's very snowy so she was going through a bunch of ice and snow and all that stuff just for you guys just for us so she's going to be a few minutes late okay so let's go on to the next question here because we have a bunch this person writes uh how do you make yourself finish a longer piece is it better to just learn how to be more efficient and quicker doing it and letting go or do you just persevere until the end? Okay, so one tip that you can do is work on a couple of different pieces. You know, maybe two, maybe three different pieces. This happens a lot, especially when you're traditionally painting, painting with uh, mediums that are really slow to dry, or you gotta wait for them to dry, like watercolor or even more so oils. Uh, you might just wanna start more than one piece at a time that way you can go back and forth between different ones and, and constantly look at your piece with a fresh eye, you know, because you're constantly moving from project to project, painting to painting. What was the other part to this? You know, should you persevere through a longer piece or should you try to learn how to be more efficient and quicker doing it? Uh, well, the funny thing about painting quickly, doing things quickly, uh, drawing quickly, is that the route to that I feel is to actually go the opposite direction go slower go slow methodical really understand what it is you're drawing what it is you're painting that way you can speed up the thinking you know if you took your time drawing trucks you know a hundred trucks nice and meticulous nice and slow and really thinking about every Thing that you're adding on there every little detail that you're doing not just copying from a photo like uh, okay I see that mark I'm gonna put that mark down I'm, I'm, I see this tone I'm gonna put that tone down but instead looking at the details and just going okay what does that mean what's that for okay I'm gonna put that here yes that makes sense to me you know going through that slow process understanding everything that is the real secret to being able to go faster later you know, because all that thinking gets quicker and quicker. So really great question. And the best way to go faster is to first really understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. And the understanding comes from going slower. Jula says, uh, my main problem is focusing on what to study. Example, I want to build a 3D animation portfolio, but I'd like to strengthen my digital painting drawing skills as well. Any tips 
advice. This is a huge one. This is such a common one with so many different people. Whatever I say, that's that's what has worked for me. That's what I found the most helpful. And I'm just saying this because there's no one absolute way of doing things. Okay, that's something that I just felt very important to kind of express to everybody to you know constantly search for new ideas, new ways. And if any of these ways actually make sense to you, if it is logical to you, then you got to do it. Okay, that's the rule. Oh, shoot, here's Terrell, right on. Hey, Terrell. Hey there. Hey, you're live. Great. <laughs> so we have a bunch of questions already, and we're just going to go through the questions, and, you know, we'll each give our little opinion about uh, the advice or the solution that you have in mind. Okay, so okay. it'll be great. And we have a whole bunch of people online uh, waiting to watch and everything. So uh, why don't we go to the question that I was just talking about. Okay, so uh, the person asks, how do you make yourself finish a longer piece? You know, something that takes a while. Is it better to just learn how to be more efficient and uh, quicker doing it and letting go? Or do you just persevere until the end? But I guess the main question here is how do you maintain the patience to finish a longer piece? Well, let's see. It, it depends upon, you know, part of it depends upon um, what the situation is. Obviously, if there's a client and they're paying you, <laughs> that's a lot of motivation right there because, you know, it's nice to pay bills and it's also nice if your piece is going to be published. So there's motivation that way. But yeah, the hardest part. Um, is you can get a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning and that's all exciting and then you get to the, the middle where you have to kind of slog through it at certain times and um, that's that's kind of where I have to play you know games with myself because while I'm in the middle of, of doing something I'm my mind is already going off to another idea of something else and I have to say okay you know let's put that in another drawer somewhere and and work on what I need to do. Um, a good example might be, say, if I was working with a paleontologist and I had to do a reconstruction of a certain dinosaur or a mammoth or something, and that takes a lot of patience. And so what I do, like many of us do, to get ourselves through is in the background, I'll have at the very least some music I like or maybe some Netflix documentary, something that is like keeping me company throughout the process. Um, so the um, documentary, like the thing that you watch on Netflix, is it usually related to whatever it is that you're painting? Like it's about nature or are you watching Parks and Recreation? You know? <laughs> it, depends upon, it depends upon my mood or if I've already exhausted, say, the PBS nature documentaries. <laughs> um, sometimes I remember doing something where I had, what was in the, in the background? Oh, it was Dexter ex episodes, and I was mm -hmm. doing these peaceful little animal things, and here's like the serial killers things going in the background. But it was really entertaining, and before I knew it, you know, I had gotten a lot of progress done on um, oh. my assignment. <laughs> so it it worked out well, even though you know you're drawing something that's quite opposite to what you're watching. Yeah, because. Um, when your mind is feeling active and engaged and refreshed, when you're working on something like if I'm doing, you know, a, a skeleton of something, you know, that's sometimes that's really fascinating. But a lot of times when you've done a lot of bones and stuff, it can get kind of dry, you know, dry bones. You know? Mm -hmm. And so when there's something stimulating going on in your brain, it's a story. Stories are great. Um, then that just feeds into the energy and I find that's really helpful to me. Wonderful. I I remember when Dexter was on, I was working on the Smurfs and I was watching Dexter and it didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to draw cute Smurfs while watching a serial killer. <laughs> it wasn't a good idea for me. Um, yeah. I tend to listen to podcasts or, or oh. audiobooks. Yeah, I've done that too. It just it depends, you know, whatever it Whatever it takes. Um, sometimes, if a particular thing I'm listening to 
isn't it working? Then I'll switch gears. One thing I really enjoy um, is I subscribe to the Great Courses Plus, and that's college level audio courses for like twenty dollars a month. And you know you can learn about black holes, or you can learn about Mozart, or you can learn about biblical history, or Vikings, or whatever you want. And that's really, really kind of a neat thing. Yeah, that's really nice, especially when it's something that is quite long. You know, I, I find when I listen to music and it's just like four minutes long, I, I keep hearing different songs. The time feels like it's going by even slower. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but before we go on, I do want to give you a proper introduction because, you know, we started off a little uh, different today. So, you know, for those of you that are watching and and you might be wondering uh, who Tara Whitlatch is, she is literally one of my artistic heroes. You know, I design creatures for a living, but um, around Tara, I, I feel like a student of creature design, a very you know, beginner level student even. Um, she's one of my favorite character designers, worked on such things as Star Wars, um, uh, Brave, a uh, whole bunch of, you know, from live action to animated, which is actually very rare. And like you said, you work with paleontologists as well. And it's just amazing the accumulation of, uh, not to embarrass you too much, but you know, the knowledge that you've gained, um, it's quite incredible. and. You know, sometimes when I'm painting and drawing, especially creatures, I like to listen to your classes on schoolism. It's nice. It's very interesting. A lot of times there will be helpful little tidbits that you'll say that totally relate to what I'm doing at the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because you are here on the stream, uh, for everybody watching, they're watching me sculpt a pug. Uh, usually, I, I'm painting a, a portrait of some sort the last bunch of weeks because I've just been kind of concentrating on portraits. But today, it's a creature because I have the, the creature expert extraordinaire online. So <laughs> there you go. And the other thing I want to mention was, you know, this is literally my first uh 3d sculpture that i'm doing oh wow yeah in zbrush because one of our new uh schoolism instructors that will be you know registering for his class very soon is justin Gobi fields and he does uh he also does creature design but he does zbrush you know mm -hmm. so i've always wanted to learn zbrush and uh finally cleared off some time in my schedule to just jump right in and learn it um, that's great yeah i i would love to get to the point where i can do something really really cool and print it out and that'd be that'd be wonderful <laughs> so we have a whole bunch of questions like i was saying so why don't we go on to the next question okay so the next question is from julia okay it was spelt all weird so i said it kind of weird but yeah <laughs> julia uh my main problem is focusing on what to study example i want to build a 3d animation portfolio but i'd like to strengthen my digital painting drawing skills as well any tips or advice uh what what would you say terrell if you had a whole bunch of different you know <clears throat> things that you like to focus on well um as far as drawing whether you're doing you know digitally or on a, on a you know piece of paper it's it's all the same thing drawing is is drawing um the best thing that anyone can do is you know if you're wanting to do people or animals and i kind of put them in people and animals in the same group uh is to observe as much as you can from real life because what you observe and are able to interpolate from real life that's your foundation that's what gives you the wings to be able to draw or portray or sculpt um, people or animals in not just realistic um, versions but highly exaggerated highly stylistic stuff because once you have the foundation then you can do you know whatever you want so I would say that as much drawing you do of actual 
people, of actual animals, and then play around with that, you know, make really weird giraffes, make really strange people. But if they're based and anchored on reality, then they will always have a sense of being convincing so that when your audience sees those characters, they can suspend their disbelief and believe in them, even if your giraffe is purple with polka dots and it's, you know, really funny looking. Um, you, they will, you will, if, if the basic components all work together, it, it moves in a reasonably naturalistic way, it has expression in, that we can read, then you'll succeed. Right on. And, and what would you kind of advise if people had more than one interest you know do they kind of tackle both interests at, at once or do you want to just pick one to do first I I'm trying to think back in my own in my own um, <clears throat> discipline grow and as I as a young person I tended to kind of do both at the same time for example if I was going to have I don't know, a dragon driving a car. Well, I would, obviously, I was concentrating a lot of animal anatomy for the dragon, but the car had to look pretty darn good, too. <laughs> Otherwise, if it was a really poor drawing of a car, then that would bring the whole piece down. So I would try to get an understanding of how to draw you know, a decent automobile. Now, there's some cars I draw better than other cars because I like certain cars better than other cars. Um, I can draw a Ford Thunderbird pretty well because I like them and I want to have one someday. But, you know, other cars I would need to have reference and, and such. But I tend to, whatever it takes, if I'm working on a piece and there's different elements, I want to make sure that each element works together. So I tended to work, depending upon the assignment, on understanding different elements all at once. But that being said, my particular interest being in portraying animals and creatures, I've always spent an extra amount of time, let's say 75% concentration on them versus, say, 25% on the other. So you but, do kind of do it at the same time, right? Like, uh, yeah. I, it's interesting. That's why I love doing these uh, streams because you hear two different opinions. I'd like to just focus in on one I'll just pick one put the other aside and just do like you know two months of just this uh -huh. um, with little bits of kind of straying away like for example I want to just concentrate on uh, portraits for for a few months and today I'm well I'm doing still a portrait I guess but it's a 3d portrait of a pug uh -huh. Yeah. all right so <laughs> let's go on to the next question here uh, gingerino asks uh how do you find that sweet spot between doing studies and doing what you want you know what's in your comfort zone um yeah oh that's a, that's that's um, a very very good question um because for myself i'm i find that i'm always trying to push past my comfort zone uh i feel once i get too comfy that i'm not progressing uh, so I, I never feel entirely comfortable, and uh, um, so I, I, I. But there is a point when I'm working on a particular piece where it feels good and like it's coming together. I don't know if there's a good answer to finding a sweet spot because I don't think I've ever really found a sweet a sweet spot. Um, and every time that I think I have, when I look at that piece. Maybe a year later, I go, yuck, <laughs> what was I thinking of? Or, and especially, my goodness, if it got published, I'm going, oh, no, there it is for all posterity. <laughs> yuck, you know. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever found that really comfy spot. I wish I could, but I don't think I ever have. Um, there is, um, and particularly in doing animals, especially particularly real animals, because a real animal always tell you how much more you need to learn mm. now doing creatures i found is actually easier to do than actual animals or actual people well, because and also every year they you know 
science finds new things about different <laughs> creatures and you yeah. know dinosaurs have feathers and you know ah, so on yeah. and so forth mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah uh okay great well for me i i like to start off in my comfort zone you know mm -hmm. then i feel good about painting i feel good about drawing and then i get into the more challenging stuff and that <laughs> that kind of works for me yeah great so let's go to the next question here Abhinav uh, asks, will there be a ha hangout session like this, like this stream for us? I I'm not too sure what that means, but maybe somebody in the chat can uh, respond to that one. That was for last week. We're almost done uh, last week's questions. Uh, next one is thinking of ways to improve my art the fastest. Should I practice what is hard for me, for example, cars, or gradually take smaller, like small challenges and build upon that? Well, um, I think it depends how quickly you want to grasp a hurdle, um, going little by little, well, that you may never get there. I, for myself, I think, well, darn it, if I need to learn to swim, I better jump into the deep end of the pool. Otherwise, especially now at this point in my life where I'm no longer 21 and have my whole life before me, I feel this more and more of this pressure, not a bad pressure, but a more and more pressure to really say, okay, um, what do I want to learn that I don't feel very good, that I don't feel I've learned yet, and there's a million things I haven't learned how to do yet, but let's choose some and and focus on those and get that under my belt and then go to the, new, the next one. Um, so sometimes if it's like little by little, then you end up not really getting there. Because mm -hmm. that's just subjective view. Let's say, hey, you know, I feel really weak and let's say I feel really weak in drawing a certain angle of maybe of uh, of people looking at a certain way, maybe their heads angle a certain way. I think, okay, I'm going to fill up pages of my sketchbook of that particular angle until I feel I've mastered it. I mean, that's a small segment, but actually that's an important segment um, from, you know, at least in, from my point of view. I totally just, agree. Yeah, yeah. I totally little, agree. Yeah. Little chunks, little things like that. So subjective. You know, if you want to, to learn something, just grab it and go for it. I remember uh, I remember actually copying one of your drawings over and over and over again and really trying to understand every single line to the point where I could draw it from a memory and things like that. <laughs> And just being able to, you know, understand that just one of your drawings allowed me to kind of branch out into all sorts of different things that kind of related to that drawing. So, for mm. example, the next step that that creature would take, you uh -huh. know, the, so thinking about the locomotion or thinking about different uh, shapes of creatures in that same kind of pose, mm -hmm. you okay. know, just being able to branch out like that, that was really great for me. All right, so next question is uh, Christina asks, uh, where I work, we have daily studies every day. Sometimes I get intense anxiety about having a good variety of juicy concepts to show. How do you balance exploring all there is and the time restrictions that you might have? <clears throat> well, first of all, there's no way that we can always have excellent, excellent, wonderful great you know like light, light bulb ideas all the time we just we're human beings are we're limited um there might be other things going on in our lives that we're preoccupied and our brains can only handle so much so i would just say hey take the pressure off yourself to be perfect their perfection you know does not it does not absolutely does not exist you can shoot for excellence we can all shoot for excellence on the particular day on any given on any given day um so just letting taking that pressure cooker off yourself will actually help you relax and come up with you know ideas um that if you're too wor busy worrying about oh my my this idea isn't good enough then it's going to kind of squish your potential ideas i mean that's the way it works with me so I would just say take the pressure off yourself and shoot for excellence, not perfection, because perfection does not exist. Yeah, and, and it also uh, 
just hearing what you're saying, it's it's like you're concentrating more on the process, not on the results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, th that seems to be a very important thing that I hear from a bunch of different uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we're getting into this week's questions. Finally, uh, are you guys coming to London Workshop? The lineup is awesome, by the way. Uh, no, we're not. Um, Terrell will be at the Portland Workshop, but I'm not gonna. I don't think I'm going to be at any workshops this year because I'm just concentrating on the online part of schoolism and I uh, really want to, you know, turn it up a bunch of notches this year. I'm pumped, you know, so I'm going to stay in Toronto and uh, keep making online schoolism better and better this year. It's going to be great. But for those of you that are thinking about going to the London workshop, I could tell you the lineup, Ryan Lang. You know, Ryan Lang from Disney to Marvel, he does it all. Carl Kopinski, amazing uh, figure drawing artist. Jesper Ising, uh, another great figure artist, but also great fantasy illustrate, mm -hmm. illustration artist. Uh, Magic the Gathering, that kind of stuff. Evan Malt Amundsen, same thing. Another incredible and very young artist that's just totally kicking butt everywhere. Uh, and David Levy. Yay, I saw David. At, yeah. David is so awesome, yeah. He is, he's, and he's funny, too. Mm-hmm, and he paints so quick. I know, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so let's go on to the next question, then. Chloe asks, did you start out, did you start out in creature design or do you start in a more scientific field? I was thinking of starting in scientific illustration after college to better my own skills. Well, um, I started out in on the science on the science side. I most of my education is not in art. Um, I had two semesters of art school, but that was after I majored in um, vertebrate zoology and um, with an interest in, in vertebrate paleontology. And my intent was to become a natural history illustrator. This was back in the 80s when I was young, in the days of yore. <laughs> and um, I fell into creature design, which really wasn't a career back then. It was just you know, part of conceptual illustration for the entertainment industry for the most part. Um, and I just accidentally fell into it when, and I was still in in art school when a couple of art directors from Lucasfilm happened by, saw my real animal stuff, and figured, oh, she understands animal anatomy, creature design, piece of cake. That's how they felt. And I don't think anything's changed. If you can draw real animals convincingly, understand their anatomies, then creature design is pretty, is relatively easy, because you already understand the principles. Plus, um, most creature design has to do with real real animals as opposed to imaginary ones. I mean, witness the last Disney production, The Jungle Book. I don't recall any unicorns in that particular movie, but lots of real animals. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. You know, and, and that's kind of interesting, too, because a lot of people, they wonder, how do I get my first big break in, you know, into the industry? I'm just starting off, things like that. And... Uh, what it seems like from many different examples is if you have a passion in something else as well, like architecture or 1920s, you know, fashion to 1930s fashion, that kind of thing, yeah. or animals uh, mm -hmm. scientifically from that scientific aspect, it always comes back into play. And a lot of times that is the thing that gives you that first big break. In the it industry. absolutely does. My first big feature was Jumanji, and I was hired. And they, were, I was hired because they need someone who could do animals. And Jumanji is all about real animals. And my, the zebras there, those are all my zebras. I had a lot to do also with the evil, evil monkeys. Um, all the anatomies and everything I worked out for all those animals, including the pelicans. And uh, yeah, and and from there on, at Industrial Light Magic and any. Anything there was, any commercial that there was an animal, any feature there was an animal, whether it was from storyboarding to design 
um, goldfish for commercials, even the Nestle's quick, you know, bunny. <laughs> um, they handed those jobs off to me. And it was totally because of the scientific background in animals, um, zoology and stuff that totally came back. And I would say that's also an asset. Um, if you, you know, art schools, brick and mortar art schools are so very spendy, so very expensive nowadays, that if you go around the other route and say you majored in another discipline and then maybe you know, got maybe some good core art courses at your JC or through schools and things like that. In mean, that other discipline, as Bobby was mentioning, you know, fashion or history, even if it was history, you had a passion of history, but I mean, National Geographic said, hey, you understand Mayan history, and you're a good artist. Hey, archaeological design, I mean, all that stuff plays. Yeah, you know, there's always that classic story of Steve Jobs learning typography and that's what really gave Apple that, that, you know, that look that, that was just mm -hmm. so different, that mm -hmm. edge. Uh, wonderful. Chloe asks, uh, did you start out in creature design or, or sorry, I think I just talked about that. So Isabella asks, uh, for becoming a creature designer, what's necessary? Do I need to know more traditional art or digital? If if it's necessary more than anatomy. Oh my gosh, you gotta know that anatomy. You, there is, you gotta there, know all of got, it, right? You, you almost have to know all of it. Yeah, yeah, because if you're thinking of creature design, I mean, the assumption is that this, especially for transmedia, let's say specifically for animation, animation demands an anatomy. You cannot make something move Unless it has a skeleton to move to move with, or muscles musculature to move with, you need as a conceptual illustrator, you need to be able to supply because you're in pre-production. You need to be able to supply the production team, which would be the animators, the modelers, the riggers, blah blah blah, with as much information as possible so they can build the character. And if you give them the 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 um, skeletons you give them the musculature you understand fur tracks all of that stuff saves so much time and money f and R&D for production um, before like with any other art whether it doesn't really matter if you're doing at the fundamental level traditional or digital, you need that core information because digital is just photon, photonized paper. Paper is just um, processed trees. It's what you, it's the interface that you draw on. Um, the fundamentals of art, anatomy, color theory, perspective, um, tone, master those. If you master those, it doesn't matter what you draw on. Yeah, like this this sculpture is literally the first time I ever sculpted ZBrush, you know, but of course, if I didn't know how to paint and draw, this would become a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. Right on. And so Fernanda asks, where do where do you start as a creature artist? Where where do we need to look to find some jobs in uh in that area oh my goodness I wish there was an easy answer to that um, my own journey like I say was an accidental journey um, if you to, to get the the widest net be sure that you can draw real animals and real people really well mm -hmm. because most creature design, when I'm including people and characters in that, but most living things, okay, most creature design is of real, real characters. Like I mentioned, the most recent example would be the jungle bug. I think, count on the fingers of one hand how many movies of a Star Wars or Avatar level are released each year. Like not, like maybe 0.1 per year. Realize the art departments of 
those productions, even those big productions, are little, small. Um, for the prequels, there were no more, that's the Star Wars prequels, no more than seven conceptual illustrators at any one time um, for those. And, and, and as far as the creature design, it was mainly mainly me um, and, and, a, a few, and, and, and some of Ian Keggs and some of Doug Chang's um, contrib- contributions in there. Um, most, as I was saying, most of the things I've done in my entire career and still to this very day have been of real people and real animals, you know, and again, that they can be very stylized, for example, in Nessie Click Bunny, things I've done for Disney, you know, but that core understanding is there. So if you have a portfolio that is just of imaginary animals, that doesn't really tell an art director, well, can you draw for our next Peter Rabbit movie a rabbit convincingly? That doesn't tell. But if you can draw real, a real, if you have a portfolio that has real animals, real animal characters, in addition to your imaginary animal characters, you're going to have a much better chance of landing work. And also, you know, like I'm sure when you started off getting interested in drawing animals, you weren't thinking, oh yeah, I really want a career in CG animation because it didn't exist really at that time. Um, Poster you know, illustration work has drastically changed over the years as well as advertising and things like that. So we can't really predict the future, right? We got to really, all we can do is really just prepare ourselves, our art skills uh, mm-hmm. as much as possible and just try to ride that wave of evolution or, yeah. right, and, and try to see where we can fit. Absolutely, because when I was, gee, when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, as Bobby was saying, there wasn't digital stuff. The closest thing to it was what Ray Harryhausen was doing, um, uh, like Clash of the Titans, and before that, the stop with stop motion, um, and and even with Star Wars, the you know um, a, a New Hope, in 1977. Well. There was just stop motion was was the main was the main thing and digital stuff was very very at its at its nascent then. Yeah, and and the amount of uh, films that had special effects was actually really little, mm-hmm. right? And Absolutely. now it's like over fifty percent of like the 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 movies that go into theaters now, it has to have this big big kind of budget feel. Yeah, and actually it's. In a way, it's starting to bite back because you can always tell, at least I can, I think most of us by now can, the CG part of any production, like, that's not real, that's obviously a CG background, that's not really this. And and then that kind of starts to actually take away from the magic of the story because it just, because as opposed to... Um, real film and real photography does, which actually is more believable because it's the real stuff um so that's starting to become kind of like a a problem in itself not only that but the the lack of kind of respect of the story mm. you know, and just trying to put this the nice sprinkles on it to try to make yeah. it look good yeah i think that's gonna bite everybody in the butt as well i agree now let's go on to the next question because there's definitely just this never-ending growing list of questions um anik asks i was in uh, i was injured and after a long time having a hard time to sit with art uh any suggestions i'm not too sure if anik is having a hard time sitting uh doing art because if so then you just try to find a standing desk mm-hmm. um but if it's like an arm injury, something like that, physiotherapy definitely helped me the most because I tried pretty much everything, trying to deal with my, you know, arm problems that I've had, you know, for a few years. And physiotherapy is what cured me. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I have, uh, I belong to, um, I have a subscription to Massage Envy. It's a chain of 
um, massage therapy, you know, for my shoulder and my arm and such. Um, I find that really, really helpful. I also do um, each night some Pilates to keep my core strong because when your core, your front and back is strong, you tend not to hunch as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been really, really, really helpful uh, to me. And then there's also just a, a kind of a psychological thing. If a person's been injured and they've been not doing art for a while, you, there's that always that process where you feel, gee, I feel rusty. And that's normal. And But the thing is, is not just keep persevere until that rusty feeling goes away. And it will eventually. It's kind of like if you go on vacation for a while, I know that if I haven't drawn for a couple of weeks, I think my hand doesn't work anymore. Mm. <laughs> feeling. Yeah, in the, in the very beginning of this uh, stream, uh, I just kind of started off the topic of just saying, you know, if if you go through your whole entire career and you never hit any bumps in the road, you never truly will know if you're successful because true success is knowing that if life kind of knocks you down, you know that you would get back up. You know what you would do if you hit road bumps, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there are times, and it happens more than once, um, in an artist's career, where they start, you can go through things where things are just coming along, and oh yeah, things are working okay, artistically you feel satisfied, and you feel like you're making progress, and then almost unexpectedly you'll hear like, hit a wall, and you'll feel really discouraged, and like, gosh, I'm not getting any better, where did the joy go, I can't draw anymore, I think I'll go work at Starbucks now, and and those are hard times, and I don't know why they happen. Sometimes it's when you've worked on something, something and something like you published a book, or you've worked on a great movie, and, and it's and and it's really great. And there's this anticlimactic feeling, and it's like, where did all the, where did all the joy of my art go? And I've run into that every so often in my own career, and I have not met a single other artist. Um, who has not experienced has not experienced that well the whole entire industry is kind of built off of okay that was good what you just did but what are you doing now yeah you know so there's this never ending kind of never satisfied kind of feeling yeah and then when you start competing against yourself or expectations that people have for you to do then it's like you have to kind of like just put the blinkers on and not listen to those voices yeah yeah, totally (laughs) uh let's go on to the next question julia asks uh i'll be attending the florence workshop uh should i bring a digital art portfolio even though my studies focus more on 3d animation um i would say bring whatever you're interested in doing you know for the for a good part of your life, you know, what's what's the most important kind of thing that you want to do and bring that? I would agree, you know, art, art is art, you know, what you do is what, it all relates to everything. Um, if we think about, you know, animation, and I, I was, I just, um, last weekend, well, I, yeah, last weekend was with, I spent the weekend with, um, when, along with David Levy, also with my with Aaron Blaze, one of the top you know Disney animators of all time, and he was my supervisor uh, on Brother Bear, and he is a fantastic artist, wildlife artist as well as animator and character uh, designer, and it, it all it all relates. It all goes into the same the same pile. Awesome. Um, next question. These are good ones. Uh, not like the other ones weren't great, but this is also great. Pralin asks, what makes a good creature design? Uh, well, a good creature design, I can quote George Lucas on this one. He said that if your design does not read on the big screen in a nanosecond, it's a bad creature design. You need to be able to tell what it is. Where is the face? Where is the tail? You need to understand it is you got to be able to to recognize it as something other than the landscape now Prowlin also has a a second part to that question which is 
how do you brainstorm uh, original ideas? Oh, um, the best way to do that is to look at nature because there is so much variety in nature. It goes on and on and on like, like cosmos, like Photoshop. <laughs> that is the best way. Uh, you know, nature documentaries are great. Going outside is really helpful. You know, going to the zoo. All nature has. You know, our brains are finite. Our brains are so finite, and nature is our treasure box. That's what I've, I've always found to be the most helpful. Yeah, it's very difficult, especially when you don't have a purpose. You know, if you're just drawing an original idea for yourself and you don't have mm -hmm. kind of like limitations to go off of, it actually gets way harder. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like if your creature needs to live in the, the high desert, well, what does it need to survive? What are its enemies? What does it eat? What does it have to do in the story or its, or its natural history? What it's, you know, all of that will shape shape your creature great and the next question we have here is from Michael uh, he asks what resources that you found at the beginning of your career that helped you the most and uh, what were they so, well oh, okay um, I'll, I'll start with this one because this is why you know I know of Terrell Terrell Whitlatch and her work is because literally she was my resource. She is my resource for many, uh, for the most part. Absolutely. And um, shameless plug, but her course, uh, Creature Anatomy on Schoolism, it's, it's you know, a bit challenging because you're dealing with anatomy, but everybody that gets through it, they come out absolutely glowing, transformed, uh, whole nother bunch of levels upwards you know in their creature design so without any kind of hesitation I would say go and subscribe to her course if you don't take the full course just get the subscription then it's only $15 a month and that's definitely worth it to jump up a bunch of notches in your creature designing abilities Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you go to, Tara? What What does the master go to to level up? <laughs> well, uh, um, forgive me that we've got this um, heat energy saving light stuff going on. So. Oh, it's okay. Actually, nobody okay. can see your video. Right. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, Jerome. <laughs> uh, when I was as a young person, let's see, I'm visually visualizing myself at 17 years old. On the weekends, um, I was, well, my sister and I, we took tons and tons of horseback riding lessons, so we were already in the world of animals. But um, in addition to that, um, after make, after I made sure I had my, you know, my schoolwork and stuff done, and I was living in a little town in Northern California, I would drive to Oakland and go to the Oakland Museum or the Oakland Zoo and draw. That's what I, I did. I would draw during the day and then I'd come home at night and I would get out my animal anatomy books. One was the good and the, the tried and true Ellenberger book, the one with the black cover. The other one was a great book by Frank W. Calderon called Animal Painting Anatomy, who really got in depth in in the function of every bone and every muscle on a wide variety of um, mammals. And I would copy those illustrations and and read, and then I'd go back to the zoo and the museum or the horses, and I would draw and try to correlate what I read academically with the real deal in front of me. So that's where I started. And, you know, that involves, includes not just, you know, mammals, but say prehistoric animals, you know, dinosaurs, et cetera. I have a real fondness for prehistoric um, mammals. And all of that really is where the core of my um, background went, even before I majored in, in zoo and paleo. And, you know, actually all those studies enabled me to actually skip ahead to several classes in those majors because I already had a lot of that information 
prior to even going into college. So, you know, it was a real a real passion, and, and I have found that in any discipline or any other, at least any of my other artists, friends that are in that same kind of wildlife art um, area, they had similar passions from a very early age. That's where I started. Wonderful. And that actually answered the next question, which Abhinav asks, you know, who is your art god? Who are the artists that you really looked up to? And you named a bunch already, uh, you know, in your studies when you were a teenager. Um, maybe you just want to repeat a couple of those just in well, case anybody missed them. Certainly. Like I started out as far as the books where I copy the pictures, those were, those are really available to everybody, you know, Dover, Dover publications. <laughs> uh, um, that would be the Ellenberger um, uh, Atlas of Animal Anatomy for Artists, and then there was um, Animal Drawing, Painting and Drawing, or Animal Drawing and Painting by Frank W. Calderon. But as far as other artists that I look up to, when I especially when I think, what you know, I I can't figure this out, or what would so and so do if they were, you know, if they had the same problem. I would say there's three I always go back to, and that would be Bob Kuhn. That's K-U-H-N. He died about oh, five years ago. He, he was a consummate animal illustrator. He spent 30 years as an illustrator before getting into more fine art. Just consummate. He His paintings are uh, so wonderful. Um, then there would be Jay Maternes. Uh He, I believe, is still living. He did beautiful murals for the Smithsonian Institution of, of Cenozoic Mammals. Just absolutely gorgeous paleo illustration. Absolutely wonderful. Um, then William D. Berry, a little bit less less known, but look at, look him up on online. Beautiful drawings of mostly North American mammals and Alaskan wildlife. Just gorgeous stuff. Other artists I look up, looked up to, still do to this day. I, I love the the line work of Alphonse Mucha. It's beautiful, and that's another artist as a young person that I copied the drawings. I loved the Art Nouveau line work. I loved the way he approached the human figure. I did a lot of shameless, shameless, shameless copy. I never signed my name because obviously <laughs> that would be plagiarism. But I learned. A lot of things I think about design and 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 uh, drawing. Just to some really great names there. I just want to add one more. Tara Whitlatch. She has a bunch of amazing books as well. Uh, definitely <laughs> check those out. I have the whole set. So um, <laughs> let's go on to the next question here. A little artist asks, "How do you deal with art block and frustration when you have a great idea?" but your drawing isn't coming out the way that you want it. You know, that seems like it's it's dealing with actual art skills to support your ideas, you know, to go back to foundational art skills, structure, anatomy. What do you think? I, I would totally agree because those those foundations, and as, you know, I've you know, been doing art since, gee, at least 45 no no at least, <laughs> longer than that years and I find myself going more not so much to the toots and whistles or special techniques I find, find myself going more and more in my ancient ancient age um, to the fundamentals always back to the fundamentals as we said you know anatomy perspective um, composition those things and always, how can I get better at the most elemental levels? Um, those are the things that, that get me going. If if I have a regular artist block, like, and we all have those days, gee, you know, my drawing's just not working today. Yuck, you know, I'm an awful artist. Ick, no, no, let's go work at Starbucks again. Uh, I just say, okay, stop it. Let's go shift gears, get out of your chair, take a walk, pet your dog, you know, whatever it takes get out of there and come back to come back a little bit later and then things tend to even out uh, and, 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 and you know, there's times when I think oh gee you know, I, I'm not getting this angle 
right. I cannot get this angle of this particular animal in this pose I want for my story, right. Well, then I'll say, okay, let's put that over here. Let's go and I'm going to I'm gonna put my dog, Josette, my greyhound, in this position. And she's very patient, especially if I feed her at the same time. <laughs> and say, okay, Josette, hold this pose. And she'll say, oh, okay, you know. And then I'll draw her, whatever it takes to figure it out. And then I've learned some things I didn't know before. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't realize that that's the way that worked. You know, that particular, you know, I couldn't that I couldn't see that. You can't see that part of the elbow from that angle. That's why that wasn't working. Sometimes it's just a little thing. But sometimes that makes all the difference. Wonderful. And uh, Natalie asks... Uh, Kind of like a general question, which is what is the best way to learn how to draw animals really well? I, I think kind of like, because um, we have so many questions, mm -hmm. uh, I think this one, we kind of talked about it in pieces. You know, you want to draw from life. You want to study, you know, videos as well to uh -huh. see how they move around. You want to study great books that deal with not just great drawings, interpretations of creatures out there, but as well as anatomy books mm -hmm. and just do all of them. It's kind of like yeah. working out, right? Like you're, you're not going to say, oh, what, what's the best muscle to work out and right. get fit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all of, it's all of that stuff. Um, you know, the truth is, is that doing animals well, it's a lifelong vocation. you got to dive in and just do it. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, if you're going to do animals well, it's got to be your passion. You, and you, and also it's important to care about them. Um, care that, that, that really comes through in your art. If you care about the animals you're drawing, rhinoceros elephants whatever whatever it is you and you see them as personalities as individuals and not as objects or accessories it makes a huge difference great and the next question i'm going to combine two people's questions because they're both about portfolios abhinav and alex okay so abhinav asks how do you start making portfolio and alex asks what does a creature design portfolio look like? What should I include? Can I combine it with visual development portfolios or a character design portfolio? It's kind of like they're asking the same thing. Yeah, it's sort of like, do you want to show a specialist portfolio or a generalist portfolio? Well, um, I have found in my experience that it's best you decide, you know, what do you want to do as an artist? You know, if and go for that. I my my portfolios have always tended to be specialist portfolios from day one. Me too. And yeah, yeah. If you don't like to do architecture, don't put that in your portfolio. If you don't want to do you know backgrounds or whatever, don't don't put that in your portfolio. Um, for creature design specifically I would include both actual animals and then imaginary animals um, I would show at least an equal amount of each not just imaginary animals imaginary animals does not tell an art director that you can that you have the goods to to perform because an imaginary animal has no peers in nature so it's always going to look, hey, super, hey, that's a great, you know, whatchamacallit. Nobody can dispute that you did anything wrong. Right, exactly. And that's not going to help you. Uh, if you have, say you've got some realistic giraffes, and then you have a really goofy-looking stylized giraffe that, you, that might appear in a Pixar film, that's going to be a lot more helpful to an art director than, you know, a... a the next, you know, your, then your best dragon, your next dragon will. I mean, I'm not saying don't include dragons. Of course, you can include dragons or whatever it is you you want. But I would I would say show really some really good actual animals, some caricatures of those animals. I mean, a real rabbit, Nessie's quick rabbit. I mean, Nessie's quick style rabbit. Uh, um, show some skeletal studies um let's say you have a, a good one is to say here's a mammoth 
and you have a, a picture of a mammoth and you have its bones and you have another illustration of its of its um, muscles and you have a page of the mammoth in different positions and stuff. Um, if you have a if you do have a variety of things like that that show an art director, yeah, hey, I can design for the next, you know, Labrador Retriever movie or the next 101 Dalmatian movie. Again, like I say, if you, if you think of all the Disney features, most of the animals that appear, whether it's a 2D feature or a 3D feature, are real ones. I mean, what about Zootopia? You know, there weren't any yetis in that one as far as I remember. Lots of bunnies and wildebeests and Cape bison. All those had, and then they showed understanding of real animals in in such. So wonderful. Uh, last, we'll, we'll just take two last questions. One question from Alex is, uh, what courses from Schoolism do you recommend for a person that wants to do children's book illustrations? Well, um, many of the courses have to do with things like uh, animated feature that kind of stuff so you got like viz dev you know painting with light and color uh design with light and color designing environments um character design courses those are all really great and of course if your book has animals in it then you definitely want to take Terrell's class as well uh but i would say just like what we were saying in the beginning, if you start studying something that might not totally be directly related to art, it will most likely still come into play, you know, over and over again, just like learning about the scientific, you know, aspect to creatures all the way down to the cellular level, perhaps, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 1920s uh, fashion, like we were saying uh, in the beginning. Yeah. Just get on the whole idea of student for life and uh, just keep absolutely. learning just like you know i try to uh, set that example as well not just to set that example but be because that's what i believe in you know so i'm learning zbrush right now you know you're just constantly learning mm -hmm. absolutely and um back in when i was you know my my late teens and early 20s as far as you know art school and such and the different majors i mean there weren't there weren't artificially designated majors like visual development. Um, there really, unless you went to Cal Arts, there really weren't particular animation per se courses. So if you want, were interested in animation, you're interested in you know illustration. Well, you majored in illustration, and the great thing about that back in those days is that. As you're trained to be an illustrator, you are actually being trained to almost like making movies. Because as an illustrator, you're you're responsible for composing the shot, the lighting, the anatomy, the direction. And I that old school illustration is what really, really prepared. You, you just learned everything, how to do everything. Everything. It wasn't divided up. Well, here is editorial illustration. Here is advertising illustration. Here is visual development for transmedia. It wasn't. You had. You were expected to know it all and have it all. And so I feel very fortunate in that I, I was still part of that particular, particular um, trend. And as far as you know, animation, two D animation. If you're an, a good illustrator, you will be a good animator because you are were trained to observe and pay special attention to life. Beautiful. So. Uh, one last question, if you don't mind. Lewis asks, I know that Schoolism Live is coming to London around June this year and was just wondering, do I need to be at a certain level with my art to attend or get the most out of the workshops? I think I could probably answer this one. Um, yes, we Schoolism is coming to London. Uh, it's going to be June 3rd and 4th. So get ready. Tickets for every Schoolism workshop for 2017, for this whole entire year, they all go on sale Monday. It's going to be the whole entire Schoolism workshop tour for 2017. So get your mouse finger clicking buttons ready <laughs> i guess because it's going to be awesome it's going to be great and do you need to be at a certain level absolutely not 
you know, you're going to find that no matter what level you're at, you go there, you're going to see professionals at very high levels, perhaps new professionals and some students as well. You know, everybody generally gets way more info than they could possibly handle at every single one of these events, which is why they're so awesome. And every single event is very different as well. So you'll be learning tons of new things. And that's the whole entire purpose of doing these workshops every year is that it's constantly different and it's constantly just filling up your bucket full of knowledge to kind of wrap your head around and to try to uh, understand and, and elevate your level of uh, skills. Absolutely. Everyone I've attended, everyone that I've attended, you know, as a participant, I have gained so much by, by sitting back and absorbing what all my co um, participants, uh, the other instructors have have taught, and it's it's just amazing, just just wonderful. Fantastic. So I just want to thank everybody for watching today and spending some time with us and seeing my very first ZBrush uh, sculpture. This is my very first one. So if you think it's kind of like meh, it's not that good. <laughs> well, that's why you know. But I could tell you that I only took. I've only gone through two of Justin Gobi Field's uh, ZBrush lessons to get to this point, which is pretty darn amazing. So definitely look out for his course as well. And of course, the biggest thank you goes to my wonderful friend and very much my artistic hero, Carol oh. Whitlatch. Thank you so much for joining us and taking some time out of your busy schedule. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, everybody. Well, that is the end of our stream. So thank you very much. And we will be back next week. And I'm going to have on here Thierry LaFontaine, uh, the artist that we have that runs the Schoolism House in St. Julien, just outside of Montreal, as my guest artist. So tune back in next time, next week, same time, same channel. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everybody. Want more to listen to while you draw and paint? Remember to visit Schoolism.com. You'll find art courses, live workshops, and over 100 free video interviews with many of the top artists in the art industry. Where do professionals go to keep learning? Schoolism.com.